Tadpavam darshitam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha mata chapita tvameva tvameva bandhuscha sakha tvameva Tvameva Vedya Dravidnam Tvameva Tvameva Sarvam Mama Deva Deva Tvameva Sarvam Mama Deva Deva Jai Guru well, I want to welcome you all to our Upanishad study group and a special welcome to those of you who are online in Zoom land. So this morning we start our study of Kena Upanishad. So what is an Upanishad? So let's do a little bit of review for those for whom this is new study. Upanishad means to sit down near. And it has to do with the style of teaching. It's a dialogue between a teacher and a student or a teacher and several students. The Upanishads are called the concluding portion of the Vedas. What do we mean by that? Well, they're not set up chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, Upanishad, it's not like that. They're all interspersed. Uh, scholars have identified 108, maybe 111 Upanishads throughout the Vedas. Some are called principal or major Upanishads. Some are called minor Upanishads. The principal or major Upanishads are called that largely because Adi Shankara commented on them. And uh, after that, he commented on them because he thought they were the most important. Although there are ones like the Kaivalya, which I think is incredibly important, which he did not comment on. Kena is considered very important by everybody. It's considered in the first two or three most significant Upanishads in the whole canon. How old is it? Nobody knows. It's from the Sama Veda, which is the Veda which is metrical. The material in the Sama Veda is not new to it, it draws on older material. So in the Upanishad, part of it is metrical, meaning it's in poetry, and part of it is in prose. So we leave that to Amini to figure out which is which. <laughs> so, um, the Upanishads concern one subject alone, 
and that is what is the nature of ultimate reality. And how do human beings, for want of a better word, participate in that or identify with that ultimate reality? The earlier parts of the Vedas, uh, we have the mantra portion, the Sanghita, which are uh, hymns, chants to be done at ritual. Then we have the Brahmanas, which are rubrics, they're instructions, largely for priests to do during the rituals. We have the Aranyakas, which are forest literature. They're kind of a bridge. They sometimes do have the highest knowledge. And then we have the Jnana Kandata, the knowledge portion. What is the nature of ultimately? So I think I said this is probably Bronze Age, somewhere between, say, 1500 BCE and maybe eight or 700 BCE, somewhere in that area. Any questions about this before we move on? All right, in our text itself, if you look, we have two Shanti mantras in the Supanishad. The first one is one most of us know well, so I think we will chant it together and it will be the Shanti Mantra we use to start the class every week. So let's chant it together for those of us who know. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Gunaktu Sahabiryam Karavavahai E jasvinavadhita masnuma vidvishavahai. Om shanti, shanti, shanti. Anamani, will you share with us the translation? Okay. Om, may he protect us both, the teacher and the pupil. May he cause us both to enjoy the Supreme. May we both exert together to discover the true inner meaning of the scriptures. May our studies be thorough and fruitful. May we never misunderstand each other. Om, peace be with us from heavenly wrath. Peace be with us from phenomenal cruelties. Peace be with us from bodily obstacles. So this is an invocation to the infinite that our study be well done together. Now, this particular exegesis on the last three, Shanti, 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 there is another understanding of these three. May we be free from disturbances in the external world. You know, you're trying to study and sirens are going by or there's war, famine, or a fight in your family. May I be free from disturbances in my body. It's very difficult if we're ill or we're in pain, our stomach is upset. So may we have some physical well-being. And then the third one here, May we be free from mental distress. So if we come to the teaching and go, what am I going to do about my daughter? What am I going to do about my mother? Oh, I had a fight with my husband or my wife. And if you have any of those issues, and if we're focused on those, it's difficult for us to focus on the teaching itself. So this is one of the most popular Shanti mantras, and it begins many 
of the principle of Upanishads. So would you help us with the second mangalam, the second okay. shanti? I'll try my best. Om apyayantum mangani vakranas chakshushrotamatu palamindri yanicha sarvani sarvam brahmopan Oh, I don't think it's in meter. Should I just read it regularly? I just Okay. Sarvam Brahmopanishadam Maham Brahma Nira Kuryam Mama Brahma Nira Karod Anira Karanam Mast Vani Ra Karanam Mestu Tadatmani Nirate Ya Upanishatsu Dharmaste mai santu te mai santu. Om shanti shanti shanti. And the translation is, May my limbs, speech, prana, vital air, eye, ear, strength of all my senses grow vigorous. All, everything is the Brahman of the Upanishads. May I never deny the Brahman. Oh, I think it, it's still going. Should I keep going? Please. Okay. All right. Um, may the Brahman never spurn me. May there be no denial of the Brahman. May there be no spurning by the Brahman. Let all the virtues recited by the Upanishads repose in me, delighting in the Atman. May they in me repose. Om, peace, peace, peace. So this one invokes slightly different things. So the first section again is, may I be healthy and vigorous so that I have what we call yoga bala, the strength, the internal fortitude to do this work. And it's not just being an athlete. Why must we have virya, virility, vitality? To do this work takes great courage. I was listening to a person last night who's in somewhat early recovery from drug addiction. He's about three months clean. Absolutely does not want to do drugs. But he's so full of fear. Right, he's gonna lose his job, lose his house, lose his relationship terrified and it's so painful that yesterday he was thinking of killing himself so the point is dying was less scary dealing with our mental and emotional material Sounds crazy. But here was a person who was willing to seriously contemplate killing himself. So many of us do not realize how much courage it takes to deal with our patients. You can tell me what klesha means. Afflictions. Afflictions, yes. Our doshas. What's a dosha? Oh. Defect, yeah. yeah. Or disease. So it's not just going to the gym and being pumped. It's not what they're talking about here. It means may we have the strength and the courage to 
let go of our fear and defensiveness enough to face all these things that hold us back in life. This is a precondition to doing this work. The spiritual life is not about superimposing some salve on my ulcerated and miserable mind. It's like lancing a boil. All that yuck that's inside my trauma my egoism, my fear, my resentment, all of it comes up and out. There's a technical term for this unloading of the unconscious. It's called kashaya. The vomiting up of the unconscious tendencies, as Swamiji used to say. And in order to face all this, it takes courage. What do most of us do instead? Let me have a glass of wine. Let me smoke a joint. Let me go watch Netflix. Let me get on a video game. Let me go have sex. Let me work. Let me do anything to not have to be with what's coming up. And then that's the first idea. What's the second idea? Uh, uh, may Brahman never spurn me. May yes. there be. So God never really spurns us. One of the oldest names for God that we have in this work is Surya. What does Surya mean? Sun. sun. The sun. So the sun just shines on the just and the unjust. It never changes its nature. But if I go outside with a bag over my head, the sun has spurred me, it's not shining. Or it may be a beautiful day outside, but if I stay in my apartment and the curtains are all drawn, the sun is spurring me. What's the sun doing? It's just shining. So understand, there is no neurotic God who likes and dislikes, accepts or spurns you and me. The grace, the love, the healing power of the infinite, Kripa, is a constant. But what's the paper bag that I put over my head spiritually? What shuts me off from the sunlight of the spirit? Ahankara, egoism, in its various forms. I fear, my self-obsession, sentiments, my need for attention and approval, comes in many, many forms. Low self-esteem, Pride all. So this is what gives me the experience 
a feeling that God's not with me. You don't feel close to God. Who moved? God did. Next idea. Um, may there be no spurning. Yeah. Uh, may there be no denial of God. Yes. So, one of the things we have to deal with is our shraddha. Shraddha means faith. The spiritual life doesn't ask us to believe in unrealistic superstitious notions. But the way of life that it suggests is based on subtle understandings and observations and they run contrary to our ordinary worldly values so there's a famous story of Hemaleka and Hemachuda in a very wonderful text called Tripura Rahasya Amaleka is the daughter of a sage and she gets married to Hemachuda, kind of a dumb prince. And she's very detached. And he says, oh, my beloved, why is it that you're not enjoying as much as I am? I'm just doing the woofty woofty and I love doing it with you all the time. And you're just kind of detached. And it's not fun for me if it's not fun for you. And she says, because she's very wise. Oh, my Lord, I am just a mere woman. And I'm always looking for where is happiness? She's setting him up. And, of course, him and a dumb guy. Well, that's stupid. Everybody knows getting what you want makes you happy. When you don't get what you want, you're unhappy. And she goes, oh, is that true? Then the teaching starts. Because the foolish person practices boga. Boga means enjoyment. They are a bogey. The philosophy of a bogey is I want to be happy. The way to be happy is satisfying as many desires as possible. Passion prizes. More, better, different. But the end result is disappointment. It's never enough. We want more. The world changes. My mind changes. So there's always a sense of frustration. Now, a yogi also wants happiness. Yogi practices yoga, meaning they engage in a way of life that reduces the number of desires entertained. So, for example, if you have someone in your life who suffered from, say, addiction or alcoholism, and get involved with a 12-step group, it's not about being strong and being able to resist. It's not that at all. This spiritual process is designed to remove 
the craving, the obsession, the desire for drugs and alcohol. What's the end result? Freedom. That's just an extreme form of the way most of us live. It's very counterintuitive in the end. So we want to have the faith to continue on the spiritual path. And what we do is rely on the four pramanas. What's a pramana? Um. I was going to say, like, practice. Well, it means an authority or a means of knowledge. It has both meanings. So we have four in this work. The first pramana is Shruti, scripture itself, the Upanishad. Puts forward a vision of reality. Shmriti, second one, the recorded evidence of men and women through the ages who thunder, it's true, it's true, it's true. And that can be from Lord Krishna and Gita, to Ramana Maharshi, Swami Chimayananda. Third Prama, my own logical reasoning. We want to think this through. This is called manana. It may seem hard to understand or accept in the beginning, but the scriptures will take us, the teacher will take us through ways of thinking. So it begins to make sense. And then the last Brahman, my own direct experience. And then as we begin to have some of this, we develop confidence and trust in the knowledge. So we do not spurn You hear the term the fallen yogi who gets disappointed and may have a misunderstanding and may leave the spiritual life and go back to being a bogey. <coughs> no blame. No blame. But they miss a great opportunity. Next idea. Um, let all the virtues recited by the Upanishads repose in me, delighting in the Atma. So, in order for this work to be fruitful, we need to be Adhikari. Adhikari means a fit student. We need to some degree have acquired the qualities of head and heart. Allow the mind to have attained a reasonable state of tranquility and peacefulness. We have many places we can go in scripture to get an intimation of this. We can go to Yoga Sutra and look at the Yamas, and the others. There's 10 of them. Five to do with our relationship with the outer world. Five to do with our inner adjustments. I'm particularly fond of the four qualifications of a fit student that Shankar articulates in Viveka Tudamani, which he brings straight from scripture. First one. Viveka, discrimination, that firm conviction in the intellect that Brahman alone is real. The phenomenal world is illusory, unreal. Vairagya, 
detachment, dispassion, that desire to give up attachment to all enjoyments gained through the senses, and the desire to let go of any personal sense of self, from the body up to and including the form of Brahma, the creator, and the life of the important person. Shamadi guna, qualities of shama, etc. Learning how to tune up the mind, this internal tranquility. Six of them. I won't go into them this morning. The last one, Mumutrutla, the burning desire for liberation. This is one of the qualities, lists of qualities, scripture puts forward that we need to have developed to some degree before the teaching of the Upanishad is effective. Next idea. Um, I think that's it. Sure. All right. So now we move into the mantras themselves of the text. So Kena, which is the title of the Upanishad, is drawn from the first word of the first mantra. So you help us out, please. Om Kene Shitam Patati Reshitam Manaha Kena Pranaha Pratamaha Daiti Yuktaha Kene Shitam Vachami Mam Vadanti Chakshu Shrotramka Uddevo Yunati Disciple By whom willed and directed does the mind light upon its object? Commanded by whom does the main vital air, prana, proceed to function? By whose will do the men utter speech? What intelligence directs the eyes and the ears towards their respective objects. So the main topic in this first section that we're going to cover is the relationless relationship between consciousness and what we think of as a human being. For the ordinary person in ignorance, it seems like my body is alive. Metabolism is going on and I can move my limbs. I can hear, I can see, I can speak. I feel, I think. I'm, I'm me, I'm an individual. But the Upanishad is saying that's not what's really going on. Now, I have come up with a new image, a metaphor. I just thought of this this past week in a class. Way back in the 1960s, when I was a kid, my father was working in the aerospace industry. And one evening he came home with this tube of stuff. I'm pretty sure it was called Lucite. And he said, this is really cool stuff. I want to show you something. So he took out a pen light. And he shined the light at one end of this tube of plastic. And a light came out the other end. It was the very beginning of the work in fiber optics. But it seemed like a miracle. 
Why didn't the whole thing start radiating? I mean, it glowed a bit. But literally, light shined out. It was as if the very end of the tube was the flashlight. Really cool stuff. Turn off the flashlight. The tube is in there. It seemed like the tube had the power to shine and illuminate as if it was a light source. But it was not a light source. It was an instrument. It was an Upadi, an equipment. So what the disciple here is asking, what is that light source, that life principle, first of all, makes it seem like I am a conscious being and my mind is conscious. I can think, I can feel, but also I can perceive, I can act, I can speak, my limbs can move. What is that life in Where is it? What is it? Is it just neurons flashing in my brain? Or is there something beyond? Pretty cool question. Any thoughts on the question itself? Next mantra. So that was verse one. Verse two is um, Shrotrasya Shrotram Manaso Mano Yadvacho Havacham Sa Upranasya Pranas Chakshu Chakshura Timutya Dhiraha, Pretya Smalokadmrita Bhavati. Preceptor. It is the ear of the ear, the mind of the mind, the tongue of the tongue, or the speech of the speech, and also the life of the life and the eye of the eye. Having abandoned the sense of self, or I-ness in these, and rising above sense life, the wise become immortal. So, as is frequent in our scriptures, the first teaching has it all. Now, the language of the Upanishads is... How can I say this? It is allegorical. It is mystic symbolism. This is why it's almost impossible for an ordinary person to understand an Upanishad without a teacher, or at least a really good. So if we take it literalistically, what is the ear of the ear? Are the little ears inside my head? What are the ears inside the ears? What are the eyes of the eyes? Do I have little eyes inside? No, it doesn't mean that. So when I hear sound waves go into my ears, they vibrate the eardrum. And the little bones, I forget what they're called. 
Remember? Staples. Say it again. Staples. Yeah. And then they go to the coat play as I would snacks. Yes. And these are the little, looks like a snail with hairs inside. Then that turns into nerve pulses. But where is it going? Who illumines all of this? And then we have these strange kinds of things. So one of the things I frequently do is at 11 o'clock, turn on channel five, watch the local news. And I love to watch Stephen Colbert's monologue at 11. Except I oftentimes fall sound asleep on the couch at about 11, 20, 11, 25. And then I have a dream. So Stephen Colbert is going blah, 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 blah. That's the sound that's going into my ears. But what I'm hearing is, let's say I'm dreaming about Amini singing, except she's doing row, 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 row. So what is the ear behind the ear? What illumines sense perception? And what is so fascinating, what is this thing called a conscious mind? I have the luminosity of awareness. Now it seems like my mind goes through mind states, it changes. Let's see, we had ear behind the ear. What's the list again? Um, mind of the mind. The tongue of the tongue or speech of the speech. Yes. What is it that allows activity, ideas to be expressed, or hand of hands, feet of feet, all that's wrapped up in this idea of this, this speech of the speech. What is it that causes the body, mind, intellect to act in the world. What is behind it? What is the life principle? Back to our metaphor of the lucite too. What's the flashlight that's illuminating everything? Next idea. Um, the life of the life. Is life just metabolic activity? Or is there a life principle? What the mantra is saying is you are life itself. Deepak Chopra was talking on TV once and the person was saying, um, what's the opposite of death? Life? And he responded, oh no. The opposite of death is birth. There is no opposite to life. <coughs> what we're going to find is the conscious, sentient being that you are is in fact birthless, changeless. It is because of you that the activity of the body happens, not the 
the other way around. Your sentience is not the result of synaptic activity in the brain. Anybody here ever had an out of the body experience? What happened, David? Uh, I have been on a retreat, and uh, that night uh, I woke up from a dream, and I couldn't tell if I was still dreaming or not, but I was looking at myself from above. Looking at your body from yeah. above. Last little few months. Yeah. And then something in me felt fear and the boom, I was back in the body. Yeah. Many people who've had what they call near death experiences have a similar thing. They're on the operating table or they almost drowned or something like that. Next thing you know, they're up on way above looking down on the body. If who you are, if consciousness were a function of brain activity, how could you view the body externally? Anybody here have a memory of a prior incarnation? Some people do. If you remember a prior incarnation, how could it be a function of brain activity of a brain that wasn't even born yet? So what is this life principle that causes the equipment to appear to be a living being. What's the next idea? Um, the eye of the eye. Same idea as we've covered before, yes. Mm -hmm. And then having abandoned the sense of self or I-ness in these and rising above sense life, the wise become immortal. So, here in this last pada, this last section of the mantra, is indicating what is it that we as yogis need to do. So, what is my problem? What is the cause of my suffering? The scriptures say the cause of it is deep spiritual ignorance of India. It's like hypnotism. When I'm in that state, I do not know who I am. And as a result of that, I think I'm the body, the body plus the personality. And what the Upanishad is saying in this mantra is we have to go through the process of discrimination between the self and the non-self. This is called Driktrishya Viveka, the discrimination between the seer and the seen. It is called Atma Vichara, inquiry into the nature of the self. And here we get the primary meditative technique that we get in this tradition. Really very simple. 
I am the subject. Anything I can be aware of is an object and is not me. Can you all see the coffee table? <clears throat> Are you a coffee table? No? Who sees the phone? I do. That's yourself. Are you a phone? No? Some of the kids think they are. So we have a subject object relationship. And you hear the sound of the traffic outside. You have a subject object relationship. You're not the sound of the traffic. So we can go through all the phenomena in the world, in the virat. And I am nothing out there. I have a subject object relationship. Now, I have a friend who's goth. He has black clothes and piercings and stuff like that and chain link necklace and things like black fingernails. Very strange. <laughs> so now he's a little bit older. He's only got one little thing in his lip. Ginger hair again. Wears regular clothes. Did he disappear because he's not wearing goth? No. You're not your clothes. You're not your jewelry. You're not your paint. Though some people think they are those things. We're going to the ballet. You need to wear a suit. Oh, I don't want to wear a suit. That's just not me. Anybody ever have those kinds of feelings? Oh, you think you're in your clothes? Then we go to the body itself. When I was a child, I had a little body. Went through adolescence and the body changed. When I became an adult, the body has changed again. Some of us are on the back end slide of life. The body's changed again. But are not you aware? of the changes in the body. You see that the coffee mug is over there. Can you see it change over here? Did you? Mm -hmm. The fact that you can perceive change indicates the subject is different than the changing object. Is your body today different than it was when you were a child? Is it? You must be the knower of those changes. I think the word is proprioception. Proprioception. Say it again. Proprioception. Proprioception, which is the awareness of your body in space and time. Dancers have to have this. You know, so you know you don't have one arm above another one. If you're doing yoga postures, or for example, Amini, who's a singer, 
If someone's, you know, tucking their head down or stretching their neck up, you've got to be aware of the body in time and space, right? Yes? Yes. Yeah. If you can be aware of the body in time and space, you are not the body. You are the knower of the body. Not this. And then the scripture talked about prana. Prana is the vital energy. It's not breath. We control the vital energy through controlling the breath. But for ordinary people who may not be practicing pranayama, some days you just feel punk, you don't have any energy. Who's had that feeling? Other times you get up and you've eaten well, and maybe you've exercised, and oh, you're all just raring to go. You've got a lot of energy. Who's had that feeling? What that is, is a shift in your prana. We all experience it. But do you know when your energy is low? Do you know when your vitality is really high? Prana is an object of awareness. You are not energy. You are the knower of energy. Now, why is this important? In various branches of the spiritual life, people work with energy. I'm doing Kundalini yoga. Nothing wrong. I'm waiting to have an experience of the Kundalini coming up to my third eye. Who is the knower of the Kundalini rising? Mm -hmm. You are not Kundalini. It's just energy. I think it's bad. It's just not the ultimate reality. Then we go to one level more subtle, Manomaya Kusha, the mental sheep. The scriptures will say the mind is the world and the world is the mind. The world that the Lord has created is absolutely neutral. But you and I, this is beautiful, this is ugly, this is so desirable, that's hideous. He's nice to me. She's me. This is a good job. This is a terrible job. These values we place on the essentially neutral names and forms of the phenomenal world is all by mind. This is what creates my world. I like my job. Oh, I have a terrible boss. I don't like where I live. Oh, this is really a cool car. Don't we have those feelings about the world? That's my mind. Joy, sorrow, anger, jealousy, enthusiasm, attachment, all those feelings. But whatever the feeling, 
are you not the knower of feeling? This morning I felt very happy. And then I got angry. Can happy see anger? Does anger know happy? I am the knower of all my feelings, all my judgments, all my affirmations. Self and not self. Now we go one level more subtle. The vijnana maya kosha, the intellectual sheath, where we have buddhi, the intellect of thought goes by. Thoughts go by like the sound of traffic outside. Do the problem two plus two in your head. Say the phrase, Mary had a little laugh. That place is where you were held. But whatever it is that you're thinking, thoughting, I am the knower. And lodged in the Vijnana Maya Kosha is the karka, the sense of agency. This function that attributes to the self the qualities of the body, etc. I.e. Jim got up this morning. I.e. Jim did the dishes. I.e. Jim made my bed. Well, actually, no, it was the body that got up. It was the body that did the dishes. It was the body that made the bed. I was ever the witness of all that. But this karta is a function in the intellect that allows the equipment to function in the world. It's not evil or bad. It's just not me. So here the guru, the preceptor in the scripture says, we have to abandon our identification with all the objects of the world, with the body, with the feelings, with the thoughts, with the Perceiver, feeler, thinker, entity. The cart of the age. But for a moment, just listen to the traffic. Let your mind be very simple. If you can thin out the See if you can notice who hears the traffic, what hears it. See, there's nothing there. Yet that no thingness shines as the light of the rain. That becomes obfuscated when the mind is functioning out of the world because of all the noises. 
that pure awareness, that chidakash is always there and going there. But I lose sight of it in my body. That's the spiritual ignorance. From that stems all my growth. So the mantra is saying here, let go of my identification with the body, with the prana, with the mind, with the thoughts, and let go of any personal senses. And with the attentive faculty turned in, in the space between your thoughts. Come on. Both bondage and liberation occur to the mind. This is not an ontological problem. It is an epistemological problem. If it were an ontology problem, an ontological problem, my being is somehow bound and flawed. I, Jim, the Jiva, am bound. I have to change my nature. What happens? Well, do I get glued on to Brahman? Do I expand and become really big? Do I merge into Brahman? No! Epistemology is the science of knowing. I like to tell the story. It's a fellow. He's in New York. He's going to a museum. He's in the Egyptology section. He's taking a tour through all the mummies and stuff. And the, the docent of the, that section says, where did you get that ring? He says, oh, this, oh, this is my old beetle ring. My grandfather left it. He was uh, an archaeologist who worked in, in Egypt, you know, back in the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. The docent says, may I see it? Oh, sure. I wear it all the time. Adds it to her. This is a scarab ring from the 18th dynasty. It's over 3,000 years old. This is a museum quality priceless relic. And I put on, I garden with it on. <laughs> How much is it worth? Priceless. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh my God. I just thought it was a souvenir my grandfather got. Did the ring change its nature at that moment? What changed? The person's understanding of what they have. has value. So also, we don't get a new self.
but because I do not know who I am. I ignore the fact of the enormous value. What? You're absolutely safe. You are birthless, changeless, deathless. And you are the fountainhead, the wellspring of all joy. It's not out there. It's myself. So this is an important thing to understand. Both bondage and liberation occur to the mind. The self is ever free. The self does not get liberated. It's my stupid mind that undergoes the transformation. And it is important. What is my bondage? My bondage is nothing more than I think on my body. What is liberation? The deeply rooted conviction based on direct experience after having gone through the process that's been implied in this mantra. And at the moment of realization, the shisha, the disciple, doesn't say, Oh, I'm a realized person. No. You think you're a person, you're still a fool. Even a realized one. At the moment of realization, they say, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. How could I have thought I was this stupid person? It was like a long dream. Where did it go? All right. I think we got all the pieces in that second mantra. Um, yes. Yes. So we'll end here for this morning. Om Pur Namada Pur Namidam Pur Nat Pur Namudachate Pur Nasya Pur Namataya Pur Nameva Shishate Om Shanti, 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 Hari Om Sri Guru Yonamaha, Hari Om.